welcome to Board Game Binge, the place where we bring you bite-sized, bingeable board game content from across the industry. I am your host, James Staley, and in this episode, we are chatting with Rob Doherty, founder of Wise Wizard Games, publisher of Star Realms, Hero Realms, and his newest title, Robot Quest Arena, which is currently on Kickstarter. Robert has raised over $4.5 million dollars on Kickstarter across 12 campaigns. He's also a Magic the Gathering Hall of Famer. Rob, welcome to The Binge. It is awesome to have you here, sir. How are you doing? Good, good. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, anytime uh, we get somebody who has the amount of campaigns like yourself that you've run, uh, it is always a treat because we can go pretty deep on, obviously we're going to talk about the game, Robot Quest Arena, a couple sure. moments. But we got an opportunity to go deeper on some things like how Kickstarters are run and things like that. So this is going to be a lot yeah. of fun. Before we get into that, though, your history, your story is is crazy. Like, it, it, you started when you were <laughs> seventeen. Uh, you signed up for the uh, for the Air Force, I guess. Is that is that right? Oh, U.S. Army, okay. U.S. Army. Uh, so uh, um, I was. Uh, um, it was the 1980s. Um, uh, Ronald Reagan was the president of the United States. <laughs> Not to date um, yourself. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, Cold War. Yeah. So, uh, uh, and I, uh, um, I was a, uh, I was a, a, you know, senior in high school. I, I have a, uh, an August birthday. So I was young for my, you know, for my class. Um, and uh, I had a, I had a pretty, uh, um, pretty severe rebellious streak, uh, at, uh, uh, at that age. And I was, uh, um, I would, I would skip school a lot. Um, I basically showed up for tests. So I'd like, you know, get, you know, fail for homework and for, uh, for class participation and stuff, but then come in and just, you know, get A's on the tests and like basically barely squeaked out of, uh, uh, squeaked out of high school. And, uh, I knew I wasn't in like a mental place to, to jump into college. Um, and, uh, you know, they had, they were offering the, you know, GI bill, uh, at, you know, at the time. Um, so, uh, um, so I signed up for the, uh, uh, for the U S army. I actually had to get my, uh, my mom had to give permission because I wasn't 18 yet. <laughs> so that was an interesting conversation. Um, and, uh, and, uh, yeah, I went, uh, uh, enlisted the U.S. Army. I knew I wanted to try and get some skills out of it, but I was also, uh, um, uh, you know, young and looking for adventure. So uh, I did a weird combination where I, for uh, they have a uh, uh, a job, they have a job description yeah. in, in the in the military school, MOS, and I was uh, uh, and I was a seventy six Charlie, which is. Uh, uh, which is uh, quartermaster, basically supply. Um, so I was like, okay, I'll get, yeah, I'll do that. So I'll get business skills. Like I can, you know, yeah. learn how to handle inventory and do those sorts of things. That's smart. Um, and but uh, I signed up for uh, for airborne, which is a, uh, a base of paratroopers. Um, and uh, basically, what the recruiter told me at the time, you know, was that basically every Every airborne units have every everybody in the you know, they have airborne units need supply guys just like every unit needs supply guys and in airborne units you know everybody jumps everybody fights yeah um so I was like oh this is perfect so I can I can do the stuff you know the fun stuff I want to do fun stuff yeah. <laughs> that I don't want to do but I can also uh, gain skills um and the recruiter assured me that I'd be you know you know if I you know if I successfully made it through airborne training I would be placed in in an airborne unit. That wasn't exactly true. So I uh, I did successfully complete airborne school, but then uh, I got placed into a uh, uh, about as rear echelon a unit as possible. Um, I was put into a um, uh, transportation company okay. uh, stationed in Fort Riley, Kansas. Wow. Um, this was part of the first infantry division. Uh, so this is back when we were geared up for war with Russia, yep. uh, Soviet Union at the time. Uh, so basically half the first infantry division was in Germany and half was in the US. And, you know, in case of war, the rest of, you know, the rest of us would, you know, come over to, to, you know, to Europe. Yep. But basically a transportation company's job was to take stuff from completely safe areas and bring them to mostly safe areas. You know, and just basically it was a bunch of truckers and mechanics 
Um, so that was not exactly what I had in mind, but, uh, but it was, you know, it was, there, there were a lot of great people. It was, yeah, uh, it, it was fun. I did my, you know, I did my, uh, my three years in, in the, uh, uh, enlisted, uh, and got my GI bill and, uh, uh, college fund and I got out and I was going to school. Uh, and then so you went for engineering, uh, though, right? Was it, was it engineering you went into? Uh, well, yeah, I want, so I wanted to go into engineering, yeah. but, uh, basically I had that terrible high school history. So that uh. was, uh, that was problematic. Um, so basically I was going to community college and just, you know, repairing my, my GPA. Uh, but then, um, uh, uh, desert storm started. Yeah. Um, and I got a, I got a telegram literally telegram uh uh and basically calling me back to active duty and it was like basically this this magic piece of paper that i had so i basically i i you know went to my uh my landlord and i was like yeah i gotta get out of my lease and you're like no you can't get out of your lease you got extra more time i handed him these papers like okay yeah you're out of your lease <laughs> went to the college and yeah. was like hey I need a refund on my tuition. They're like, no, you're past the date for that. Handed them the thing. They're like, okay, yep, you got it. And then, uh, um, and basically went to the airport and handed them that paper. And then, yeah, you know, they put you on a plane. And so you actually uh, got deployed. Yeah, so that, um, no, yes, and no, mostly no. So basically, in that war, there was this massive backlog of uh, getting troops to uh, the theater, right? Yeah. Like basically. We were just, you know, ma there were massive logistics involved. So while I was in active reserve, and the inactive reserve hadn't been used in forever, but starting with that war, they started using them on a regular basis. Um, and so we got called up, but uh, we were, uh, they, they were basically, there were delays getting people over to, uh, uh, to, the, to the theater in Southwest a West Asia. So basically it took a long time to get people going. Uh, and during this time, uh, basically the big concern was chemical warfare. Mm. So um, they we did uh, daily uh, 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 training in the, in the uh, gas chamber, basically tear gas chamber to basically, the idea of this training was to show you that your, your protective gear actually worked. So basically you'd go in wearing your protective gear and you were fine. And then you'd take, take it off, off your protective gear and you'd be choking on tear gas. And, and they were like, hey, so, and they just, I, I cannot t tell you how many times we did that in like, uh, uh, in, in, you know, in prep to go over. And it got to the point where everybody just, just wanted to get over there, even yeah. though, you know, it's, it's insane. Um, and uh, uh, the day we were, um, we were uh, supposed to be going, um, uh, basically that's the war ended. We were basically, we're in, uh, information to basically to, to, to deploy, to go. And they basically said, not sending any more troops over. And they started, you know, like inactive reserve, go here yeah. and, it, you know, other people, et cetera. So, so yeah, no, didn't actually go to, you know, didn't actually get deployed, but kind of got called up. So it was very weird. Uh, scenario but then yeah then i went into college uh and basically um uh i uh, applied to northeastern university in boston and they were like yeah your grades were not good enough uh if you want to get in you need to take these courses in in, in your community college you need to get a's in all of them um so i took that took those courses in a semester and got a's in all of them and then i got into uh, Northeastern University uh, as an uh, electrical engineering student. Wow. Now, and you didn't stay. So at some point you decided you're going to get into games, I guess, from there, right? Some, there was kind of some kind of shift in there. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So I was, uh, so I was, uh, I was electrical, electrical engineering student. Northeastern had this, has this really cool program where basically you spend half, uh, they break the year up into, uh, into quarters and half of the quarters you're in class and half the quarters you're at a job um and uh um and so the freshman year you just do all classes so i did all classes freshman year loved the classes got i got a had a like outstanding gpa did was doing really well um and uh then it time, came time to apply for jobs and i got a i applied for work at uh, a place called the miter corporation and i worked uh, in a uh, there was an image processing research laboratory mm. and they did all kinds of cool stuff with uh 
um, uh, data analysis on uh, using uh, um, uh, things like sub pixel analysis for uh, like figuring out uh, uh, for getting more uh, resolution out of like satellites and mm. uh, data compression for uh, for uh, for sending mug shots over uh, to uh, over radio waves and all all kinds of you know all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, but basically, as I studied, what I uh, more what I learned was I really liked the physics and the math, but I wasn't actually that into the engineering. It was okay, but it wasn't mm. like a passion. Yeah. Um, and then I was a little bit deer in the headlights because I was like, all right, if I want to work in in physics or if I want to work in math, I really need a PhD, and that's you know many many more years. And right about this time. Magic the Gathering came out and uh, I got into it very early, like when the game came out as a collector. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I, I was into like uh, comic book cards, you know, collecting uh, stuff like that. And I liked strategy games. So this game basically, you know, uh, yeah. uh, scratched all itches. Uh, it was, you know, so I got really into it and I was collecting it. But I discovered very early on, oh my gosh, this is hard to collect. I bought a box thinking, okay, that'll do it. Uh, cause that generally did with, uh, things. And then I re then basically it didn't do it. And then I figured out what their rarity scheme was and realized they had a print sheet of 121 rare cards and that you got one per pack. And then of course, okay, as you're trying to collect it by opening packs, when you get to one card away from your collection, on average, you're going to have to open 121 packs just to get yeah. that last card. So that's many boxes. It's hundreds of dollars. And I was, you know, I was a poor college student. So basically, uh, I started selling my extra magic cards uh, online. As far as I knew, I was the first person to sell magic cards online. Like, you know, there, there may have been others. I have no idea. But I distinctly remember when the first other person posted that they were selling cards for money. I was like, hey, that's my thing. I think they shouldn't be able to do that. Um, but uh, but basically, I sold cards uh, there. And I also went to the magic clubs at MIT. I'd, I'd, uh, I'd pack my backpack full of uh, uh, full of magic cards and hike across the Charles River and go to the uh, go to the game nights at MIT. And I'd play there. And I'd also sell cards to, uh, um, you know, uh, to people there. And um, I was able to actually make a really large amount of money selling cards and turn that into buying more cards. And this, this snowballed uh, um, and it got to the point where I was earning enough money that my, my grants and loans were in jeopardy because hmm. I, I no longer was qualifying yeah. uh, for them. So I decided to take a break from, uh, from school and uh because i wasn't sure what i wanted to do anyway and go and open the game store and go into uh you know selling cards full time my assumption was that that would fail miserably then i would be poor again and <laughs> i'd have figured out what i wanted to do at school and i'd go back and you know and uh and uh and you know and, and go back to studying but the the uh the the game store was you know was kind of gangbusters so basically um i was at the game club at mit uh and um a friend of mine ricardo uh, uh was talking to somebody and he said oh you need to talk to rob and the guy was uh was from the boston globe and he was doing an article on magic uh, and uh, he was like oh rob's opening a game store you should talk to him so the guy you know basically talked to the guy he got my story and uh and the day i opened my uh uh my game store uh in the front page of the of the of the of the newspaper in the section in the you know i can't remember which section it was but basically one of the sections of the newspaper front page big story picture magic cards and they had this interview with me and it said rob doherty who's opening a game store in Davis Square today. <laughs> and so there were all these people walking around the you know, walking around the town where I was opening up my game store looking for this 
looking for my shop. Meanwhile, my shop was on the second floor. I had a little sign, mm -hmm. uh, but mainly I was opening the shop because Wizards of the Coast had started put in this rule where you couldn't buy large quantities of cards anymore if you didn't own a physical store. So yeah. I was like, okay, fine. I'll have a physical store. I'll buy lots of cards. I'll sell them online like I've been selling online. All, you know, And then I'll have these tables where my friends can play games with me. And so it'll be like a little game club and I'll keep doing my online sales business. But no, we had like hundreds of people come in that day, like you looking for cards. And I had this insane inventory because I had, you know, I had been doing this thing where I'd been rolling over and putting all my money into more and more cards. So I had just, I had everything in large quantities and just had gangbuster sales from like, uh, uh, from that day. And, uh, uh, yeah, so I, so the game store thing was going full blast and, uh, um, and, uh, uh, and never actually got back to college. So, uh, <laughs> so know, when so did I've got you... a couple of years of an engineering degree, which is, you know, all education is helpful. I think is the, is the lesson here, right? Is <laughs> I always say that to my kids too, is just get some education cause it'll, it'll, it'll do you well in the future. So when did this transition into your first uh, Kickstarter? So what, what was the first Kickstarter you did? So first Kickstarter that I ran personally was uh, for Star Realms. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, basically, I uh, um, I got into I had a game store. I got into making. You know, I had always been into tinkering with games and making games, and I made some small products like accessories for Magic tokens and such. Then I started making games. Went through multiple game companies, making games that some people really loved, but never really caught on and sold. Uh, really well. My first big hit was with my friend Justin Gary. We did a game called Ascension, which is mm. a deck building game that was that was big hit. Uh, you know, really popular. Um, and uh, uh, and then I uh, then I made uh, Star Realms with uh, as sort of a side project uh, uh, with my friend Darwin Castle. Um, this was mainly we were started out just trying to do a resume project for him yep. because he wanted to get work in uh in games uh and i was like oh you should make a game that'll be the you know that's a just a great way to get started with it and then we just got really addicted to the game we were working on and uh and and at some point i was like we should just make this ourselves and then we so we did a kickstarter for uh for star realms um and uh that went really well uh we raised about fifty thousand uh, dollars on that Kickstarter, um, and uh, and demand was really really high. Um, you know, for, from the Kickstarter and you know, stores start uh, place started ordering more. I upped our print run to ten thousand units uh, for our first printing, which I thought was insane. Like basically, it was yeah. you know, I've, I was worried as I was doing it that it was way too much, but it wasn't close. We blew through um the first printing in the first year we printed like 10,000 units and 15,000 units and 20,000 units and 30,000 units wow. just basically turning the money we were getting around as quickly as possible uh, making more games uh star realms had msrp of 15 still has an msrp of 15 bucks this little box uh uh here's the size of a like a fat deck of cards and uh but it's a full deck building game uh and uh, uh and people really like the play of it um and uh that little box was going uh on uh ebay people were reselling them for like 80 dollars wow. um because they were so hard to find uh that first year but uh and we won uh a tabletop game of the year from by uh from south by southwest um and a whole bunch of a uh, bunch of board game geek game of the year awards and uh uh etc so we won, we won like seven game of the year awards uh uh, for Star Realms, and it was just a massive hit. Um, and then from there, um, uh, we did uh, um, we launched multiple games. And yeah. uh, uh, our next Kickstarter after Star Realms uh, raised half a million dollars wow. instead of like fifty thousand dollars. Basically, because people were like, Star Realms is so good. If you guys are making it, we're going to try it. So, uh, uh, so that was obviously awesome to see. And it was basically the first time I really grew to having a, a super strong platform. Like I've been making games, yeah. you know, uh, for a long time and really hard to get the games in front of people, like get stores to carry them, get people to try them. 
Um, and finally, I had gotten to this point where basically if we made a game, a whole bunch of people would try it. Uh, and that's uh, a really awesome, <laughs> awesome place to be. So that is super cool. So on that note, your most recent Kickstarter you've launched, Robot Quest Arena. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, the people that are listening uh, to our podcast that can't see, we'll try to use as descriptive uh, language as possible. But I'd be remiss if we don't go through this game because it looks awesome. Um, so so, cool. so yeah. I'm sharing my screen. So let's talk a little bit about Robot Quest Arena. So, I mean, right now you're at 200 and se- I'm going to put this in Canadian dollars because it always sounds larger, but two over $275,000. <laughs> Uh, you 2,824 backers. You still got 17 days to go. Uh, yeah, th- we're in our, we're basically tomorrow is our one week mark. So yes. Yeah. You guys are crushing it. There's no, there's no doubt about that. Right. So uh, walk us through this game. You got these super awesome minis. You've got some, I guess, deck building elements into it. Um, yeah. yeah. So this, this, this game is really cool. So it takes uh, deck building, like Star Realms, Hero yeah. Realms, you know, Ascension, Dominion, that style of, okay, you're, you're, you're doing the, the straight deck building thing, but it's on, uh, on a board where you have a miniature and you get these, we got these awesome, uh, awesome little miniatures and uh, um, you are moving this robot around and battling other robots in the arena. There's all kinds of like game tiles, which do various things like this, the solar panels, it gives you extra energy if you're on it. So basically um, you have this tactical skirmish battle game Mm -hmm. um, that is powered by uh, by a deck building game. When you you have cards that give you energy, the primary resource in the game, you can use that to buy additional cards, just like you could n- normally with a deck builder. But you can also use your energy to move. One energy will get you one point of movement in the arena. Um, uh, you can uh, and movement you can use offensively in that you can push other robots. So basically, oh, cool. if you, for two points of movement, you can take a robot and move into their square and push them out to the next square. That's cool. And it, uh, it, you can also push robots into other robots, in which case they both take damage. Push robots into walls; they take damage there. There's a bunch of there's hazardous tiles in the game like fire and tax and uh, uh, you know saw blades, all kinds of crazy stuff. You can. Uh, um, you can you know push other bots into that, uh, which is a lot of fun. Um, and so you get these really really interesting turns where you've got okay, I've got I've got four to spend. I could buy this four cost energy card, which will let me buy bigger stuff later. I could buy these two weapon cards, which will allow me to attack other bots and score victory points in the game. Or I could move to this advantageous tile on the arena and get start getting benefits from being just from being there or i could move over to this person and push them into this you know into this nasty thing and do a bunch of damage um so you get all kinds of cool like uh options that come up just by the nature of how the game works and then uh and you also have weapon cards weapon cards when you play them they do damage you got hand-to-hand ones which you can use against somebody who's right next to you or range ones they can use against robots that are multiple spaces away and when you attack somebody and you damage them they have health uh which is represented by these little like beads Mm -hmm. and uh you when you deal a damage you just take one of their health off of their card and you put it into your victory point pile um and uh so your attacks basically get you victory points. Um, and when the last health is taken off a robot, they're removed from the table, but the player isn't out of the game. They don't miss any action on that player's next turn. They immediately respawn at full health. So basically you're dying a lot and you're killing your friends a lot over and over again. Um, uh, and But you're always like jumping back into the fight. Do they lose the upgrades? So if somebody dies, the next no, round will respawn? No, so basically as you're buying, ba- basically dying is no big deal in robot quest basically (laughs) all the cards you bought you keep um and so basically literally you pick up your piece you wait for your turn on your turn you come back in at full health but you have to uh, enter on a spawn point so you'll not be in the place in the arena you were previously so it's a lot like when you're playing a video game and you die and you're like oh i'm back to the spawn point run back to where i was you know like that's uh uh so it's got this sort of uh, video game esque feel in that sense, but uh, but yeah. So one of the nice things about that is um, while this is a free for all arena battle game, you don't have the gang up problems that you frequently have in free for all battle games mm. because dying is not it's not a big problem. So like if everybody decided to gang up on me and they attacked me, okay, first couple people kill me, great. 
my pieces off the board. Um, then the third person's like, well, I guess I'll attack one of my team, my fr- people I was teaming up against Rob with because I have these attack cards. Um, and then on my turn, I respawn and, you know, I go and do my thing. So it doesn't, uh, it's not how many times I die. That's not, me dying is not a problem. It's how many points I'm accumulating on my From turns. Attacking. So you yeah. want to set up really cool plays on your turn, do lots of damage, push robots into each other, do, do all kinds of, you know, do as much carnage as you can on your turn. Um, and if people kill you, no biggie, you just respawn and, and get back into the action. So when I look at the, the packaging, right, uh, in, in at least what's in on Kickstarter page, I can see like peg holes, for instance, on, on the minis and so forth yeah. is, so has this been, de- this has obviously been designed to go into retail, right? When, yes. uh, after it's fulfilled, but there's a lot of exclusivities I've seen in there. So there's exclusive packs are just for Kickstarter. I think I yep. saw a mini in there actually that's just for Kickstarter as well. Is that fair yep. to say? Or? Yes. Yeah. So basically yeah. there's a Kickstarter exclusive robot. Um, and there are Kickstarter exclusive cards and Kickstarter exclusive tiles. Um, I really love the running Kickstarters and the Kickstarter exclusives, uh, in that we get a lot of great feedback from the backers during the campaign Yeah, and we can make content based on the stuff that they're asking for. Um, obviously using our knowledge of the game and the system to make, you know, sometimes people will ask for things that actually wouldn't be fun if you implemented in the game. But a lot of times the ideas are actually really good and cool and we can make those and add them to add them in these stretch goals. But also in the stretch goals, you can do stuff that you wouldn't feel comfortable doing in the regular game because Kickstarter backers tend to be pretty savvy gamers. So they're mm-hmm. advanced gamers. So basically you can throw curveballs at them that might be a little too confusing for the average customer who's going to be opening up the product. Sure. So we can put a lot of weird and cool and wacky things in those Kickstarter exclusives that maybe wouldn't be ideal for coming in the base set box um, uh, because they'd you know be a little bit uh, um, too confusing for the uh, for uh, the average person opening up yeah. uh, opening up a box off a store shelf. Uh, but kick, as I said, Kickstarter backers tend to be the type of gamers who are they're super into games. They're buying them, you know, they're paying money well ahead of time to basically get games early and to get the extra stuff. And so these, you know, the, the people who are doing that, they, they can handle it. So you can, you can do some really interesting and cool stuff with those. With your minis. um, Now I notice there's two versions of the game. There's a, like a standard game and then there's like a deluxe version. The deluxe, I believe comes with the minis. What Actually, you... the the standard version comes with the minis. Oh, it does. Okay. The deluxe version just has more content. So basically, got it. it's the okay. we've got the basic tier and we've got the high tech tier. Basic tier comes with a base set game and it comes with four minis. And a really big feature is the minis are full color. So basically, you won't have to uh, you won't have to paint these. Uh, so um, that was important to us because the the world is so rich, the IP is so cool yeah. and and flavorful. And also we're trying, we design deck builders that are really easy for people to enter at, mm-hmm. but have wonderful complexities that you can get through play. So basically a very, the, the type of games where you can play it with your friend who doesn't game, your mom or your brother who doesn't play, doesn't play this type of game, you can teach them and they can handle it. But, um, you know, uh, I'm a, I'm a Hall of Fame Magic player. One of my business partners is a Hall of Fame Magic player. We're very competitive. We like to beat each other up in games, and the ga- so the games we design can handle that level of you know high end play. Yep. Um. So uh, um. So basically, you end up with games which have a lot of depth. Like with Star Realms, for example, people play Star Realms hundreds or thousands of times you can look at like people's like play logs on the online version yeah and they there are literally people with like ten thousand games uh, wow. in um and so the replayability is super high the uh the the room for skillful play is really high but easy to learn and we're doing the same thing with robot quest so because it's an easy to learn game great for casual people like the gray miniatures that people can paint themselves that's really cool like i i like those i used to play a ton of warhammer and paint models and do all that sort of stuff but it's a pretty wonky hobby and Mm -hmm. your average kid buying a game you know in the store is not going to paint it 
and a, a gray miniature would not do this world justice. It's no. a very colorful and lively world. Uh, so the pre-painted miniatures were very, very important. I think us. for the people that are hardcore anyways, they may do their own kind of uh, touch-ups on on the robots anyways, make sure. them look distressed. And so like I've seen some really crazy stuff yeah. online. With the number of campaigns you've done, which has been a lot, um, what would you say is um, kind of the biggest learning or the biggest thing you would do going forward you do going forward now on, on subsequent campaigns what, like what's something you've locked into you've learned that if there's another publisher listening right now or they're thinking, gosh, you know, where do I start? Or, you know, what are some key things I need to do for my campaign? What's the one thing you would say they need to do for their campaign? So, so basically I'll gear this towards someone running their first Kickstarter sure. campaign. Um, and, uh, the, uh, imp super important to not get carried away and to do your math, do your due diligence ahead of time and figure out the true fulfillment cost of every stretch goal that you put in there. Yeah. Like people get very excited in a Kickstarter campaign and they ask for all kinds of cool things. And the backers just see the number of dollars um, that are being raised and they don't think about fulfillment costs and such. So they might ask, for example, for like a deck box. And they'd be like, you just raised a hundred thousand yeah. dollars. Surely you can do a deck box. But what you as the Produce the the person running the Kickstarter has to do have to do is think about okay how much does the deck cost cost to, to make okay how much does the deck box cost to ship how much does it cost to store is it going to push me over a weight threshold or package size threshold and increase shipping costs universally across the board yeah like there are uh, a lot of Kickstarter campaigns that are run by novices they who, first time creators and such they will get carried away they will over promise and then when they go to fulfill the campaign they'll end up losing a ton of money they'll spend yeah. all the money the kickstarter campaign raised and then like have to mortgage their house or something to to end up to fulfill because they got from from the point by adding something in that was that did have a, one of those big hidden costs like maybe a shipping cost or whatnot yeah. they will push themselves over a threshold where instead of making money with every backer they end up losing money with every backer so you know you got to look at your margins know what they are figure out what you can offer and what you can't figure out your stretch goals ahead of time as much as you can you can take feedback from players and you can know okay i'm going to be doing some cards so maybe some of the cards are undefined and you can get uh get feedback from the players but uh you know but basically like doing a play mat as a as a uh as a freebie as a you know a stretch goal probably is a really terrible idea because they're expensive <laughs> to make and they're heavy yep. uh and you know it, it could work up here now if you really want to add a play mat sure add a play mat do it as an add-on yeah. If a person wants the payment, they can pay for it. They don't want it. They don't have to. Uh, so that's that sort of watch out for that pitfall would be the advice that I would give to. I'd say um, watch out for your add ons as well. Like this is one thing I ran into in my last campaign was uh, there's pick pack fees. Right. So most of the yeah. fulfillment houses will say, you know, we will pack up to three items for this cost, but each additional item over and above those three items is going to cost you another 50 cents, another 60 cents to, to pay. Yeah. So, you know, if you got the smorgasbord of, uh, of add-ons, you're like, oh yeah, I'll just add it all on. It's great. People can pick what they want. Well, keep in mind that you're paying fulfillment costs and pick pack costs for each additional piece you put in that box over the certain standard level that those, uh, those fulfillers have. Yeah. Not to mention, mention the logistics of getting all those items pre-positioned yeah, in your, to fulfillment your fulfillment centers house. around the world. And barcoded uh, and all this kind of be, stuff too, right? Yeah. And you can also get bitten by minimum order quantity. Like yeah. if you offer an add-on and uh, and eight people buy it, okay, well, my minimum print quantity is 2,000. So I guess I'm printing 2,000 units to fulfill these eight. Uh, you know, like that's- uh, You might you as well can, 3D you know, print it at that, at that number, right? Yeah. Like <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, you basically you have, you, so, so those, you know, those sorts of things, but, uh, add-ons are obviously safer than, yeah. uh, than stretch goals because of the, you know, the fact that you can get some revenue to offset your costs. But, uh, but yeah, that's, there are, um, you have to be careful in what you are, uh, in what you're putting out there. Yeah. You can give people things that they will love that won't cost you a ton to, to ship or to fulfill. Um, and you can give people things that they might not even like as much, but, but cost you a fortune. So you gotta, you know, you just have to be careful which, what things you're offering. 
What's the biggest mistake you've made across all your campaigns that you've, that you've learned from and that others should learn from? Oh man. Um, so, um, I, uh, I think my, my biggest problem is with, and this is a recurring problem for me because I never learn. Uh, I, I am super perfectionist on the, on the game yeah. and, uh, I will, we, we, you know, sometimes we'll be late in the process and, you know, a designer will come up with something and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so good. We have to, we have to change it and put this in. And then, you know, three, four months out the window because, you know, like, you know, making this, you know, making these late changes, you know, it's, it's good and bad because, you know, it makes me very happy with the end product when it, you know, when it actually finally goes out, but sometimes they can, you know, they can be significantly late and that will cause you a lot of headaches that, you know, you don't, you know, don't need to give yourself. Uh, so, um, but I honestly, I still have a problem with that. Like, basically I can't, I can't resist, you know, those, uh, that's one of the things about having, being the CEO and basically uh, having your own company, uh, is there's nobody, I mean, you know, obviously, you know, like your, uh, your, the other officers in the company and stuff will, you know, will say, Hey, I don't think this is a good idea, but if you really want to do it, you can do it. Not, you know, whereas if you're working for some other company, they'd be like, yeah, that's crazy. Save it for the next product. You know, we, we've got a deadline here. Uh, so, uh, um, so yeah, there's some, there's some dangers there and, uh, um, you know, just trying to make things uh, too perfect. Uh, perfect at the cost of, uh, you know, of the cost of the deadlines. I had a, uh, a boss once say to me that seek excellence, don't seek perfection. Yeah, <laughs> that's, right? yeah, that's good. You can that's never get, you can never achieve perfection, but you can you can achieve right. excellence. Um, right. So you've done obviously you published a, a lot of stuff, right? And you got a lot of stuff on in, in the go, and we didn't even cover half of the stuff that you've done as part of. I don't even know how you have time to do all the stuff you do because you've got a pretty robust resume. Um, What's next on the deck? You must have another game coming. Is there anything else coming uh, yeah, soon? Yeah, so we've got we've got some uh, great stuff. I think the the next item up on the on the deck we've got a oh, we've got a game called Hero Realms, uh, fantasy uh, deck building uh, game, and it's got really cool elements where you can play as different character classes. They have different skills and abilities. You can go on adventures, level them up. You get these permanent upgrades, and there's skill trees, and you make choices of what skills and such you get. That's cool. Um, we're taking Hero Realms and making it a digital app, much like uh, we have the Star Realms digital app. But the Hero Realms digital app, um, we're basically taking it in a, a different direction uh, than Star Realms. So basically, there's a good reason for, for you to own both apps and play both apps. With the Hero Realms app, we've incorporated the, the PVE leveling stuff that we have for the Hero Realms campaigns. And we've taken the PVP version of that and that is baked into the game. So basically, when you're playing Hero Realms, the, online, the digital version, whether you're playing versus the AI or a campaign, or you're playing online versus people, you will create a character, select a class, name your character. You will gain experience points when you play. You'll uh, so in the game, you'll be buying cards and you know, in, in standard deck building style. End of the game, your deck resets, but when you level up, you get a permanent bonus. You have skill and ability cards that um, that can change and upgrade you know, with your experience. You'll find magic items that are permanently added to your starting deck. Um, so basically, um, you so you'll be playing online and you'll you'll know, start a game with your like level six cleric, and you'll you know uh, and somebody you'll you'll get an opponent. Oh, it's you know a level seven fighter yeah. and you've chosen certain skills and abilities with your skill points they've chosen certain skills and abilities with theirs so you've got very uh asymmetric uh um starting positions uh with that and um win or lose your game you will gain experience so your character will move up you know basically move up levels over time if you win you get experience faster than if you lose but you'll still get experience either way so your character will be leveling up uh, and you also there's also a ranking system in it so basically those wins will give you will increase your ranking losses will decrease your ranking but your level will always be going up so basically it's a digital deck building uh game with 
characters you're building and leveling up over time and customizing. Um, so, you know, if you played two different, two fighters, one might be wildly different than the other because you're choosing different skills, finding different magic items, et cetera. But you don't have to just play a fighter. You could play a thief. You could play a ranger. You could play a cleric. You could play a wizard. Um, and of course, we'll have the additional content coming down the road with the uh, the ability to play non-human uh, uh, races. So you could play uh, play as an orc or play as a small folk or uh, play as an elf or a dwarf in addition to the classes. Um, so... Uh, we got that coming up for Hero Realms Digital. Super excited about that. We'll have we'll be coming to Kickstarter soon uh, to get into the beta and basically help us, you know, help us make this game the way you want it to be. Uh, and then uh, we have a new uh, new sets for Hero Realms Physical coming to Kickstarter. Uh, we have all new character classes coming. So you'll, we've got uh, classes like the Necromancer and the Druid. Um, uh, coming to Hero Realms. Uh, there's an all new base set for Hero Realms and a, uh, a 12 part advent uh, uh, adventure uh, where you can take your character starting at level one and move, we'll go all the way up to level 12 um, and uh, uh, for the physical game. So, a lot, a lot of cool stuff coming for Hero Realms. And we have cool stuff uh, for all the games coming up, but I don't want to take up all your time with them. So the short uh, short answer is you've got a lot of stuff coming down the pipe. This a lot is crazy. of stuff coming. We got we got a legacy set for Star Realms coming out. We've got a uh, we've got a game we're doing with uh, Richard Garfield coming. We've got all kinds of stuff uh, in the uh, uh, in the pipeline. So um, wow. yeah, it's uh, the 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 team never stops working. Well, on that note, uh, I want to wish you all the best on uh, your current Kickstarter you. campaign, which is uh, Robot Quest Arena. If anybody wants to uh, find a link to this Kickstarter, it's in our show notes. Just check out the show notes. There's a quick link to the Kickstarter there. Or if anybody knows Kickstarter, you just go to Kickstarter and you just search Robot Quest Arena, you'll find it. But I know that this is probably going to end up double what you have right now. And uh, it's certainly going to be a great, great success for you guys. I can't see, uh, wait you, to yeah. see where it ends. So thanks again for coming on the podcast. I really do appreciate it. And you have a great year. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Take care. Cheers. This has been an episode of the Board Game Binge Podcast, hosted by James Staley, produced by James Staley and Mike Bruner, with original music by Nick Smith. If you would like to watch these interviews live, simply join the Facebook group Board Game Binge, and you'll get access to live interviews, giveaways, and interesting board game content from across the industry. I can't wait for you to join us. See you next time. 